All right, so what I handed out was the schedule for the rest of the period. Let's not even go over it except for this week. So today, all I'm going to do is lecture on Chapter 6. All right, I spent the weekend working on stuff for the other class that I teach. And uh, for lack of better words, you've heard the saying, it was a cluster. All right, I had a lot of problems in some of the stuff I was trying to do. So... That between that and the Packers just sucking royally yesterday, I mean it was like hard. It was it's very hard to watch when a team is that bad. All right. Yeah. Well, to be to be honest with you, the Rams sucked yesterday too. You know, I think they're a better team than the Packers are right now, but they sucked yesterday. So, and I don't like Minnesota, but I don't hate them like I hate the Bears. So I don't hate them like I hate the Lions. So if they're going to be the ones that are going to, you know, go to the Super Bowl or whatever, I can live with that. So today, just lecturing on Chapter 6. Tomorrow, we're going to go over some of the examples for Chapter 5 and some of the ones for Chapter 6. And I'm going to give you um, a hard copy and go over it with you of a JavaScript form validation example. We should be able to do all that in the first half of the period. And the rest of the period will be lab. Wednesday, I'm going to go over the test. That'll take probably an hour or so. And um, after that, uh, the rest of the period will be lab. Again, we'll go over the other stuff once we get back. I will tell you, you may or may not care, but I'm planning on having us a week from Thursday build a game. I don't know if I have the game up still, but I was going to show it to you. You may laugh or say it's whatever. Uh, and it doesn't have to be this. These are just the ones that I chose, so... It's not the hardest game in the world either. It's a JavaScript game though. So, oh, that is the left. Sorry. That's not it. I use that as a baseline for lack of better words. This is it. Yep, that's my daughter. She's in those are dresses, wedding dresses that are falling over by her. So, I didn't make it. But if I get there, then she says says she said yes to the dress. So, and I'm probably going to put that, unless she really has a problem with it, onto the website, too. But we'll see what she says. All right. And I got sick yesterday afternoon, so I was supposed to go over and visit her, and then I didn't want to, and she thought I was mad at her. So it was like, just leave me alone. All right. So if you have your book... You can open it to chapter 6, which starts on page 363. And again, we'll go over this for the first part of class today. So, Chapter 6 is on enhancing and validating forms. We have already worked with forms. You did a lot of work with forms. We had a chapter on forms back in when we were talking about just HTML. And if you remember, then we looked at some of the stuff you could do with HTML5 to enhance forms. Adding a required field, doing things like setting up patterns, using a number uh, you know, for, for type equal numbers, so you can only allow numbers, etc. So you can use a lot of that stuff. But there are certain types of validation it's very hard to do without JavaScript. Plus, and we talked about this before, if you have somebody who's got a very old browser, shame on them, but people still do, all right, JavaScript may be the only way that you can go. So you can see there's only three Objectives, enhance form usability with JavaScript, customize browser-based HTML validation, and implement custom validation to check for errors and display error messages. So what we talked about in the last chapter, and I'm, you know what, I, I wasn't even going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Your test that you will have a week from Wednesday, it'll still be on BMI. All right. I'm not sure what, but that's the plan right now because it's much easier for me to just have a revolving thing. So I would say that before you take that test next week, all right, if you had problems with the previous test, 
on Wednesday, I'm going to be recording how I did it, how I did the test. You might want to go back because people will say, well, can't you just give us a hard copy? I could, but I'm not. All right, because then it becomes that all you're doing is data, is data entry, and I don't want that. If you want to take the time after I go over this to update yours so that it works the way it should, great. And if you don't, that's your call. All right. All right. So, as mentioned, without JavaScript, there's only certain things that you can do with form validation. And I want to tell you something. This might sound weird, but I want you to hear this. If, if I go and I go out to Amazon.com, all right? So if I go out to Amazon.com and I go over to books and I decide that under books, I want to find something on JavaScript. Maybe JavaScript and jQuery. All right. So I'm looking. Eh, it doesn't look bad. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that looks pretty good. In fact, that's the, one of the books we're going to next time the class is taught. So I look at this and I say, yeah, that looks like it'd be pretty good. Okay. So I click Add to Cart. All right. Now, what is going to happen when I go over it? I'm not actually going to buy this. But when I go over to my cart and I start filling things out, some stuff will change, just so you notice. First of all, that changes from HTTP to HTTPS. It's trying to give me a secure type of connection. They want, they want to make it hard because when they go through there, they're going to start asking me, well, I need credit card information. I need, need name address type of information. When it's doing all that stuff, it is validating it on the client. It has not yet sent it when I hit enter. It does not yet send it out to the server for Amazon. The reason it doesn't do that is if I screwed up. So let's say that I put in something wrong in there, whatever it happened to be. All right. And I put in a, a wrong something and I send it over to the server. So I click submit. If it goes to the server and the server finds out there's a problem, it's got to send it right back to me. Does that make sense? So I'm wasting the server's time. Their servers have plenty to do. So the idea is when you, is not, this isn't the greatest example, but especially when you're filling out a form and you hit a submit button, typically you, you run a, a round of validations on the client side. Does that make sense to people? Now the problem is you can come in, and I'm not going to show you how to do it. You can read it in your book, but I can go in and click. I'm in Chrome here. If I click way over here, on these three dots, there's a customized thing that's over here. And I think it's under settings. I don't even remember. But I can literally go in there and I can turn JavaScript off. And some people do that for whatever reason. So the problem is if the only place that I validated was on the client and somebody turned JavaScript off, now it's stuff is sent to the server. And if it was never validated there, bad things could conceivably happen. The reason I'm telling you that is when I go and, and, and I fill out an HTML form, especially where I'm giving information, all right, and maybe I'm buying something, maybe it's something else, and I hit a submit button, then a series of form validations is going to be done on the client. All right. If all those pass, it goes over to the server. Does that make sense? But it runs almost the same exact validations again on the server. So it's doing double duty. But it's being done on two different machines. The client stuff is being done on my machine. The server stuff is being done on Amazon server or wherever, you know, I'm trying to buy something from. But that's an important thing to realize as we get started here. And I want to come in here. And update that. All right. So I think this is on the test. I believe they ask you what validation is on your next written test. As it says, it's the process of checking that information provided by users conforms to rules. That's it more than anything else. So it says that if, if it's asking me my name and the name is mandatory, that I don't leave it blank. If it's, it, maybe you've noticed this if you filled out enough forms online. When they're asking you for numeric fields, 
typically, a lot of times, it's a, either a drop down or it's a number field. You may or may not have noticed that, but when I just was in uh, on Amazon site and I wanted to change the number I ordered, I was a drop down and I could order up to 10 of them in there. All right. Why do they do that? Because that way I can't write hello, for example, in the number to order. So it's just one less validation that has to be done. That's all. All right. And again, they talk about some of the programmatic things that are in here. That's fine. Now, when you work with forms and you learn this in the last chapter, when we talked about how everything on a web page is an object, and that includes the form. The form itself is an object, and the form object is made up of a lot of other objects. Label objects, text box objects, button objects, radio button objects, uh, checkbox objects, etc. So it's made up of a lot of different stuff. All right. Now, some of the properties that are connected to a form are shown on the bottom of page 364. You may or may not have noticed this before, okay? But forms have an autocomplete property. So, it, why is that done? Well, it's done more than any for, for more than any other reason for testing. So, if I create myself a form, I'm not going to do that right now. But if I create myself a form and I fill it out a few times, all right, and then I go and run the program again and I type in Jeff, there'll be a thing there that typically will be an autocomplete, and if I choose it, it'll fill in the rest of the form for me. You can turn that on and off because that literally, all right, it's just a, a Boolean field. It's a true-false field. Elements. That has how many elements you have in the form. It gives you a collection. You now know what an HTML collection is. We talked about that last week. Length. Returns an integer with a number of elements on the form. So this, elements, is the actual collection of elements itself. Length is the number of elements there are. No validate. This may not sound like a big thing, but if, if you get a job as a web programmer, you'll always want to put a no validate in there. What that does is if somebody has turned JavaScript off, it will cause whatever you put in between those no validate tags to come up on the screen. Typically, it'll be a paragraph that says, you must uh, turn on JavaScript validation for this to work, or whatever it is you decide to put in there. When you click a submit button for a form, here's a surprise, the submit button fires. Most forms also have a reset button. So when you click that, the reset event fires. All right. Some of the wor work that you can do with this, there's a check validity. So notice what it does. It returns true if every control is valid. So if I have said that I've got 10 fields on my form. Six of them are required. So if any of those six are missing, check validity will return false. Does that make sense? If a certain field has to be numeric and I make it non-numeric, then check validity, check validity will return false. All right. Some of these things that you see here on the bottom of page 365, and it goes up to... I guess uh, it's on the next page too, but you know some of this stuff already. We've worked with placeholders. We did that back in when we were working with forms before, chapter 9 or whatever it was of the other book. We looked at required. All right. Did you notice that when we said that a field was required, that if you left it off, it would just came, come back with a generic message that says something like, this field is required? All right. What you can do is you can put in your own messages when that stuff fires, if you want to do that, by using the validation message. Some of the stuff that's in here, middle of page 366, where they talk here about some of the events for forms. Guess what? You have seen these before. We have looked at some of them between chapter 9 and the previous chapter. I already talked to you about what a blur event was. All right. You may or may not be aware of this, but if I've got a text box and I'm asking you for your name, all right, and I put in my first, my, they ask for my full first name. So I type in J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. 
That means that seven different change events will fire, one for each letter that I put in there. Why is that important? Well, let's assume that we're going to set it up so that name cannot have numbers. So if you put in a number, that will be invalid. And you can't have a space, let's say, in your name, and you can't have a special character in your name, you know, a comma or whatever. So if I set all that stuff up, I can put that in the change event so that if the user types in something they shouldn't, I just refuse to accept it. The reason I'm telling you all that stuff is that when you've got required and some of these other things we see from HTML5, all right, and, and you know, think about this. If I say that a, that a form field is required and I leave it off and it comes up with a message that says this field is required, there's JavaScript that's running to make that happen. So it's calling these different types of events to make sure that what we want to have happen, happens. All right. All right. This is on your test. All right. It says, well, most developers use get element by ID, etc. There is another way that you can address form objects. You can do this. So as it says, if I want to be able to, to, to access the first element on a form, and I don't want to use, for whatever reason, get element by ID, I can use this. So the tag name is form, and it's element zero, which is the first one. And there's even a faster way to do it, which is like this. This one is on the test. All right. So know that that is another way of doing this. And they show how you can refer to a bunch of them that way. And then the author says, you know, one advantage of doing this, I'm going to even make it simpler than what the author has here on the middle of 367. The biggest advantage of doing it with a get element by ID is it's more intuitive. All right. You don't have to worry because if you are using it the other way, you have to know exactly what element number you're working with. And if you decide you're going to add another element in the middle of your form, Boom, now that's going to, if you had a bunch of code in there, it's going to screw it up if you use the numbering system. So typically you're going to use get element by ID. In this chapter, as it says here toward the bottom of page 367, in this chapter, you will work for Snoot Flowers, a flower shop in Davenport, Iowa, that has commissioned an order form for their website. The, the order form has been completed, okay, in that, this is what it looks like. All right, this is shown on page 368, all of page 368 in the book. I can make this smaller. That won't let me make it too much smaller. All right, but think about the kind of stuff that you have in here. So you have to place an order. We, it, since these are check boxes, I suppose it's, it's possible you could have more than one all right, so you've got a congratulations. If you want, you can have up to 250 characters. All right, then you've got the billing address. Notice the billing address and the delivery address. Let's just talk about this for a second. If you look at it, you'll notice they have the same fields in there. So if what you're billing to is the same place you're delivering it, if you click this checkbox right here, this will be filled in for you automatically. If that checkbox isn't checked, then the presumption is the address that goes in here and the address that goes in here are different. All right. And then we've got a delivery date. Now, can you check stuff in there? Yeah. For instance, you shouldn't be able to deliver something to 2016. Doesn't make any sense to do that. All right. Payment. Might sound real simple. But this stuff is pretty complex. And actually, the numbering system for Visa is different than the numbering system for MasterCard, which is different than the numbering system for Discovery, which is different than the numbering system for American Express. Usually, all of them have like 16 digits. So you can check for that. And it's kind of like with a, with a uh, social security number. It's number, 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 dash, number, number, dash, number, 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 number. But it's like I believe it can't start with four zeros. So it's the same kind of thing in here. All right. So this is stuff, again, the form has been built, but you're going to go through and make changes to it as you go through the chapter. All right. So 
One of the most important formulated roles of JavaScript is validating rather user input. It says, however, before you do that, there's a few steps you can take to reduce the amount of validation necessary. Number one, design forms to collect more accurate content. As simple as that sounds, what that's saying is design it for somebody who is not the brightest bulb. All right, so anybody can look at it, figure out what it is you're asking them, and ideally do it correctly. We've talked about this kind of thing before. As an example, the more drop-down fields that you can give the user, the less chance they'll screw up. All right, just as an example. But if you look in here, you know, card type, well, you could put it in there like that, right? But... Notice the difference between card type right here and the card type that we have here. We've got radio button. Why? Because it's harder to screw it up. Okay? What if somebody puts down, instead of American Express, they put down Amex? All right? Are you going to necessarily know that's the same thing as American Express? MC. You know for sure that's the same thing as MasterCard, etc. So when you do something like this, that's making it harder for them to figure it out. All right, you might want to come in and instead of having this, you might want a, a calendar control right there for the expiration date where you can't go backwards from today, for example. All right. Now, what they show here on page 370, again, this author has no way of knowing you've already gone through creating forms using a different book. So the author is, is basically, for the first time, showing you, introducing some of these controls, most of which, bless you, you've already used. You've used radio buttons already. You've used checkboxes already, etc. So you've looked at that stuff. So again, if you look in here, we've already made it a lot nicer. We've got the buttons, and we've got the expiration date, which is going to have just a month and a year. The other nice thing about this is the old way, where we just had a text box here, it's much harder to validate. All right. And what's to stop somebody, rather than saying that, that what month is this, November? November, you know, 11, 2017, What's to stop them from literally in the text box typing in November 30th, 2017 type of an idea? All right. So again, the idea is you're trying to make it as hard for them to screw up as you possibly can. Nothing is foolproof. All right. Another question that's on the test says, in addition to providing Users with limited sets of possibilities, you can create JavaScript functions that reduce the likelihood of errors. All right. Such functions as these, as these are known as assistive functions. Because one of the questions on there, I think it's a true-false, is assist, assistive functions perform validation. They don't. It says right here they do not perform validation. So if you're asked that, a true-false, it's false. Make sense? But as... as an assistive one, as an example, if I've got a drop-down list of states, I have no way of knowing that Jesse actually lives in Missouri. If he puts in there O'Fallon, let's say, and but he chooses Illinois, there is an O'Fallon, Illinois, whether you know it or not. All right, the system has no way of knowing. Oh, he meant O'Fallon, Missouri. Okay. Now it could, if if you put a lot more code in there, if he put in his uh, zip code. It could figure some of that stuff out. All right. It says two aspects of the Snoot Flowers order form would benefit from assistive functions. First, the form includes a number of selection lists. By default, browsers select the first item in the list, but they don't want that. So in other words, as an example for state... If you don't select anything, and if you don't have it set to Missouri, let's say, by default, all right, and it'll just, it gets what it's set to by default, Alabama. Why? Because that's the first one. That's why sometimes what you'll see in there as an assistive function is 
please enter a state. Because they know if you haven't entered a state, it'll still, it'll still say, please enter a state. So that's an assistive function. All right. Some of the element properties that you can use with a select is shown here on page 372, the length. Multiple, which means that you can select more than one. Selected index, which literally is the one that you selected. So if I've got a drop down, let's just say that it's a four year institution and I've got freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. All right, and you chose junior. That's the third one, so it's selection two because it's zero, one, two, three. If I've selected none of them, then selected index is negative one. Really important thing to remember. If, you, if you've got a drop down list and you haven't selected anything, the selected index is negative one. If you choose the first element, then the selected index is zero. All right. So they start going through there and they have you literally go through and start coding it. All right. And you'll notice there's some code here and there's some code on page 373 and 374. So again, when you look, it says selection lists display no default values. We already have talked about that. Maybe that's what they want. They don't want something that says select the state. They just want nothing there. All right? Because then all you're choosing, you're checking for is nothing. So there's nothing for that. There's nothing for an expiration date. So that's the first bit of code that they have you put in there for this example. Okay. Now, when you're working with option elements, and that's what you have on a select list, I don't want to sit and read this to you. But I do want to mention the two more, most important properties, and that's these two here. The text and the value. Okay? I might have on a drop-down list of states, I might have the, I might have the name of the state. So my, I might have M-I-S-S-O-U-R-I. So that would be the text that would actually appear on screen. But if I throw it out to a database after you fill out a form, I don't want it to say M-I-S-S-O-U-R-I. -S I want it to say M-O. Does that make sense? So although the text and the value can be the same, quite often the text, the text is always what you want the user to see on screen. The value is how you're going to save what they put in. They can be the same thing, but especially when you're working with something like states. That might be the full state name. That might be the state abbreviation. All right. So notice what we're doing. To add the functionality to the student order form, you start by creating three nodes. All right. Like it or not, the author is going to come through here and make sure that you keep working with DOM stuff. So if you look on pages 376, 377, 378, 389, I, I'm sorry, 378, 379, 380, and going up to page 381, all right, in fact, I'm just going to jump up to 381 here. This is what we're doing. And if you look up on the screen here, this may not sound like it's that big a thing. This is damn hard to do. There are what, six or seven months, what is it, January, March, May, July, August, October, and December. There are seven months out of the year that have 31 days. There are four months out of the year that have 30 days. And then, of course, there's February. All right. And I used to always have students program this. So once you picked a month, it would tell you the right number of days. It's amazing how much code that takes to do that. All right, especially if people try to be real precise. That can take you a good 100 lines of code. All right, adding placeholder text for older browsers, bottom of 381. You never need to use placeholder text, but with HTML5, you have it now. So you'll notice, you know, they might say something in there for like a phone number. They want you to put it in in this format. So they might show number, 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 dash, number, 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 dash, etc. All right, that's what you put in a placeholder text. To me, you know, the other thing that people sometimes do is they don't have labels on their forms anymore. 
Instead, where it says first name, you put that in as placeholder text, and then you don't need a label. All right. Every place is different as far as how it does it. So again, starting on the bottom of 382 and going on to 382, 383, 384, 385, 386, 387, and 388, there's more code that you have to put in. Now, don't let that throw you because there's so many pages because what you find is this is what you want to do. You want to put in this placeholder text. And the author goes to painstaking lengths to explain to you everything that's being done in every step. So much of the stuff that's in here, you've already done similar things. All right. Turning up toward the bottom of page 388. All right. On that page, the author talks about text areas. Remember what those text areas were? We would create a form, and at the bottom, we would create a text area that had the number of rows and the number of columns. Quite often, you'd put in there for like a comments area or whatever. All right. These are things that you can use. You can put placeholders in with that. You can put in default values. All right. And again, starting on 389, 390, 391, 392, and 393, you're going to put in more code. Now, I do want to mention, because this is on the test, on the bottom of page 390, another way that JavaScript is commonly used to improve form visibility is to copy data entered in one field to another field that the user indicates should have the same data. Remember when we looked at this at the beginning of the class and we had that build to address and then we had the deliver to address and the deliver to address had a checkbox on it and I said if you check that it would copy all that in. That's exactly what they're talking about right here. I don't remember the, the context but this question is on the test. All right. So again you will put that in on pages 390. And when we go up to page 393, now you see it. So again, once that was checked, it'll fill everything in for you automatically. And that's nice. Now, if you screwed it up up above, it's screwed up down below. All right. That, there's no way, because that's the human element in there. That's very hard for you to account for. And again, if you don't know this, I have no idea how many zip codes there are in the United States, but there's a lot of them. You could set it up so once they put in a zip code, you could fill, fill in the city and the state for you. That's a lot more code than you probably think it would be. All right. Not that it's a big thing, but let's see. So how many zip codes in the U.S.? 43,000. All right. That would take you a while to cope. You could say, well, I could grab all of them. You know, yeah, you, there are ways that you could cut it down. For instance, what is it? I think O'Fallon has got like four zip codes. All right. Or three zip codes. So, yeah, you can cut it down like that. I'm sure New York, New York has got a lot of zip codes. So you could cut it down like that, but it's still going to be a hell of a lot of work. And then what if the person just, you know, puts in the wrong zip code and you tell them and they never look and now they've got the wrong state in there but they're just an idiot and they never realize they put the wrong state in there. All right. Again, don't think stuff like that doesn't happen. It does. All right. Bottom of page 393. Customizing browser-based validation. It says, almost without exception, even the best design form needs validation. One of the main reasons is that most forms contain text boxes, and when you have text boxes, that brings in the human element. Anytime you bring in the human element, you're asking for trouble. All right, you just are. 
most people, when they fill something out, they're not really being all that attentive and making sure that whatever it is they're supposed to fill out, they're actually filling out. Or it's not even a case of being attentive or not attentive. They just want to get through it as fast as they can. All right. So it says when you, when you validate on the client side, it's also known as browser-based based validation or as native validation or now as HTML5 validation. These are some of the things that you can use here on page 394. We've looked at some of these. All right. An important one here, for example, max length. That's the maximum number of characters that you can enter. So if I have, for example, a zip code, I might make max length 10. So I can either put in five numbers or five numbers, a hyphen, and four numbers. If I don't even care about those, that hyphen and the four numbers, I might just make it five, five numbers. All right. We've looked at patterns before. We looked at required. The step, as it says, if, if I'm going to sit there and I'm going to create um, a text box, but I want the type to be number, and I want the values to be 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500, you with me? Just those five? If I don't set the step value, I won't have five values in there. I'll have 500, 400, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, etc. So you can work with step to make it easier for you. Color, I know there's not much more you can say with color. Dates, the biggest thing with dates is most people when you set up a date field, you want a date field, you don't want a date time because if you don't put the time in, it always defaults to midnight. Most people don't like that because then there's all this stuff there and they all say 12 colon, zero zero colon zero zero colon zero zero for hours minutes seconds and milliseconds all right so again you will be adding more code then on 395 396 in fact if we look here on 396 you may remember this i mentioned this the other day but you may or may not have remembered it we talked about stuff that bubbles and I mentioned that if I've got function one that calls function two, that calls function three, that calls function four, and I've got some code in here, and that code fails. If I'm using bubbling, it checks first here to see if, I, if it's going to, oh, am I, am I uh, responding to the error there? If it doesn't find it, it checks there. If it doesn't find it, it checks there. If it doesn't it find it, it checks there. If it doesn't find it there, you're hosed. That's bubbling. So it already starts at the bottom, works its way up from the very specific to the very general. On the other hand, if I find an error there and I start at F1, if I don't find it, I go to F2. If I don't find it, I go to F3. If I don't find it, I go to F4. That's called capturing. So they're opposites of one another. So it's the order in which it tries to find how you're going to handle an error. If it goes from the bottom up, it's bubbling. If it goes from the top down, it's capturing. All right. And they go through that in here a little bit. And they start showing you, you can see all the required fields. If you make everything required and you put in nothing and you click submit, they all turn red. All right, bless you. Now, something that's in here that's new also, if you look on in your book on page 397, and what's new there is, notice what we've done now. After the form has been submitted, we're giving feedback to the user. Now, you wouldn't probably do this for no other reason. That's really hard to read. All right. Plus, what do we have here? We've got card number. We just have a one there. That's not too bad. And the one for the CVV. All right. But there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of information here. This is the information that's going to be, after it's all been validated, this is the information that's going to be sent over to the server. So it can be validated again. All right. On page 398, customizing browser-based feedback. All right, it says, as you saw in the preceding steps, modern browsers display browser-based validation in 
similar ways. Might be a little bit different, but they're pretty much similar ways. This is on the test. Constraint validation API. Many aspects of the way browsers present browser-based validation feedback are customizable using constraint validation API. So the question is something like, how can you customize it? The answer is constraint validation API. I think that's the only question that has constraint validation API in there as anything. So remember that. So we're talking here, whenever it says basically that you can customize it, they're talking about, all right, if you want to be able to totally customize, you're going to have to add some code. So they show you some stuff here on 398, and they show you some stuff there on 399. And you go in, and you will actually put in some of this code as you go through here. Much of it is already set up for you. Does everybody understand that, let's say that I don't want, when, when, I, when I get a field that is required and I put, don't put anything in there, it turns red by default. Does that make sense? If I don't like it to turn red, I can go in with CSS and change the color. Maybe what I want to do is I want all fields that are valid. Maybe I want all those to be green. And if they're red, I don't want anything to show. All right, so there's all sorts of ways that you can customize this stuff if you decide that you want to. All right, the author says here, in preparation for writing custom validation functions for all, functions for all browsers, you'll add the no validate attribute. All right, again, that no validate, as we mentioned, that thing will run if the user has JavaScript disabled. Every computer basically has JavaScript available to it. All right, every laptop or every desktop or whatever. Okay, but you can turn it off. And they show you what you're going to do on 401 and 402. All right. Then on 402, let's go through this, and then we'll take a break. So on 402, they start talking in here about custom validation. Wow, that is many pages. That is literally just about the rest of the chapter. So even though it's a little early, let's come back. Let's take a break, and let's come back at about uh, three minutes after nine. All right? We'll pick it up on page 402. Programming Custom Validation.